could the huge success of the novel have anything to do with the fact that it dealt with a period of medieval history that that's possible since its invention a little over 130 years ago the interview has become a common place of journalism Christopher Sylvester he talks about the opinions of different celebrities about interview today almost everybody who is literate will have read an interview at some point in their lives and from the other point of view many thousand celebrities have been interviewed over the years some of them even repeatedly so it is not surprising that opinions of the interview of its functions methods and merits changed considerably some might even make extravagant claims that in its higher form it is a source of truth and in its practice it is an art others usually celebrities who see themselves as its victims might hate the interview as an unwarranted intrusion into their lives or they feel that it diminishes them just like in an ancient culture it's believed that if one takes a photograph of somebody then one is stealing his soul Vizna Paul feels that some people are wounded by interviews and lose a part of themselves Lewis Carroll the creator of Alice in Wonderland was said to have a just horror of the interviewer and he never agreed to be interviewed it was his horror of being lionized lionized means made important which made him repel his acquaintances interviewers and the persistent applicants for his autograph acquaintances are known people he didn't like publicity in this way rather he would silence all such people with much satisfaction and amusement by his creations Rudyard Kipling expressed an even more condemnatory attitude towards the interviewer condemnatory means unacceptable his wife Caroline writes in her diary for the 14th of October 1892 that their day was wrecked by two reporters from Boston she writes that her husband said to the reporters why do I refuse to be interviewed you ask because it is immoral it is a crime just like a crime as an offense against a person like an assault and it deserves a punishment assault means physical attack it is cowardly and vile vile means very unpleasant no respectable man would ask it and give it though he made such statements yet he himself made such an assault on Mark Twain a few years before yes some years before he himself interviewed Mark Twain ironic H.G. Wells in an interview in 1894 referred it as the interviewing ordeal ordeal means unpleasant experience he considered the interview as an unpleasant experience but he himself was a frequent interviewee he had interviewed Joseph Stalin Saul Bellow who has agreed to be interviewed on some occasions had once described interviews as being like thumbprints on his windpipe Saul Bellow described interviews as thumbprints on his windpipe what does this mean it means he felt suffocated being interviewed yet despite the drawbacks of the interview it is a supremely serviceable medium of communication Dennis Bryan has written these days more than any other time our most clear impressions of our contemporaries contemporaries are the people living at the same time are through interviews almost everything of moment reaches us through one man asking questions of another because of this the interviewer holds a position of unprecedented power and influence now you will watch an extract from an interview of Umberto Eco the interviewer is Mukund Padmanaban 
from the Hindu. Umberto Eco, a professor at the University of Bologna, has already acquired reputation as a scholar for his ideas on semiotics, literary interpretation, and medieval aesthetics. Semiotics is the study of signs. Signs. Not science. Then, he turned to writing fiction. He has written large and wide ranging forms, ranging from fictions, articles, books, academic texts. He became extremely popular in 1980, with the publication of his novel, The Name of the Rose, which sold more than 10 million copies. The English novelist David Lodge once remarked, I can't understand how one man can do all the things Eco does. How do you have enough time? Maybe I seem to be doing many things. But in the end, I'm convinced that I'm always doing the same thing. And then I have a secret. Did you know what will happen if you eliminate the empty spaces from the universe? Eliminate the empty spaces in all the atoms? The universe will become as big as my fist. Similarly, we have a lot of empty spaces in our lives. I call them interstices. Say you are coming over to my place. You are in an elevator, and while you're coming up, I'm waiting for you. This is an interstice, an empty space. I work in empty spaces. While waiting for your elevator to come up from the first to the third floor, I have already written an article. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone can do that, of course. Your non-fictional writing, your scholarly work, has a certain playful and personal quality about it. It's a marked departure from a regular academic style, which is depersonalized, and often dry and boring. Have you consciously adopted an informal approach, or is it something that just came naturally to you? When I presented my first doctoral dissertation in Italy... Dissertation is a long essay for a university degree. One of the professors said, Scholars learn a lot about a certain subject, then they make a lot of false hypotheses, then they correct them, and at the end, they put the conclusions. You, on the contrary, told the story of your research, even including your trials and errors. At the same time, he recognized I was right, and he went on to publish my dissertation as a book, which meant he appreciated me. At that point, at the age of 22, I understood, scholar books should be written the way I had done, that is, by telling the story of the research. This is why my essays always have a narrative aspect. And this is why probably I started writing novels so late, at the age of 50, more or less. I remember that my dear friend, Roland Barthes, was always frustrated that he was an essayist and not a novelist. He wanted to do creative writing one day or another. But he died before he could do so. I never felt this kind of frustration. I started writing novels by accident. One day, I had nothing to do, and so I started. Novels probably satisfy my taste of narration. Talking about novels. From being a famous academic, you went on to becoming famous after the publication of The Name of the Rose. You've written five novels against many more scholarly works of non-fiction. At least more than twenty of them. Over forty. Over forty. Among them, you've written a seminal piece of work on semiotics. But ask most people about Umberto Eco, and they will say, Oh, he's a novelist. People know you more as a novelist than as an academic of semiotics. Does that bother you? Yes. Because I consider myself as a university professor, who writes novels on Sundays. It's not a joke. I participate in academic conferences, and not meetings of pen clubs and writers. I identify myself with the academic community. But okay, if they have read only the novels. <laughs> I know that by writing novels, I reach a higher audience. I cannot expect to have one million readers with stuff on semiotics. Which brings to my next question. The Name of the Rose is a very serious novel. 
it's a detective yarn at one level, but also delves into metaphysics, theology, and medieval history. Yet it enjoyed a huge mass audience. Were you, at all, puzzled by this? No. Journalists are puzzled. And sometimes publishers. And this is because they believe that people like trash and don't like difficult reading experiences. Consider there are six billion people on this planet. The name of the row sold between 10 and 15 million copies. So, in a way, I reached. Only a small percentage of readers. But it is exactly these kind of readers who don't want easy experiences. Or at least don't always want this. I myself, at 9 p.m. after dinner, watch TV, and want to see either Miami Vice, or Emergency Room. I enjoy it, and I need it. But not all day. Could the huge success of the novel, have anything to do with the fact, that it dealt with a period of medieval history that? That's possible. But let me tell you another story. I often tell stories like a Chinese wise man. My American publisher loved my book. But she said, she didn't expect to sell more than 3,000 copies in a country where nobody has seen a cathedral or studies Latin. So, I was given an advance for 3,000 copies. But in the end, it sold 2 or 3 million in the US. A lot of books have been written about the medieval past, far before mine. I think the success of my book is a mystery. Nobody can predict it. I think, if I had written the name of the rose ten years earlier or ten years later, it wouldn't have been the same. Why it worked at that time, is a mystery.